We're here today in Salt Lake City for Deal Disruptors, joined by Landon, co-founder of Listo, a global HR platform. How are you today? Great, great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited because we've been chatting, I feel like for over a year now. Probably, yeah. And we've never met. Yeah, for sure. Great to meet you in person. Right? And how has everything been going for you as a founder? Oh, what a year, right? It's like uh, the the weeks feel like years in and of themselves. And then the, the years go by and all of a sudden you're like, wow, I cannot believe it's already been over two years that since we started our company. So um, it's been incredible. Yeah. And how did Listo come about? Talk us through the inception, your other co-founders and like, I'm just really curious of like, take us back two years ago. Yeah. Uh, the three of us actually work together at a consulting firm mm. that does global expansion consulting services. So they would help a company set up a legal entity and, you know, do accounting and payroll and taxes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then a solution came about that a lot of human resources leaders and some people are starting to become more and more familiar with, but it's called employer of record, which is, I just want to hire a few people in a country. I don't want to full on set up an entity and stick my flag in the ground in France, you know, just to hire two or three people. And so what we do is we use our entity and it's called employer of records. So at that company, we started offering that and the demand has been enormous. Um, and uh, anyway, there, the, I had left earlier, um, done some startup things, and then I'd been begging them for years. Like Tyler was our general counsel and Freddie was what I would call the William Wallace, just the everybody loves Freddie, wants to be a part of him, learn from him. He's on the consulting side. Um, and so anyway, finally peeled the two of them away two years ago. We quit our jobs and uh, said, let's do this. So started in May of 22, you know, around then, and then the, the capital raise market like tightened up like literally, you know, six, eight weeks after that. So um, did which, you, yeah. did you raise? We raised 2 million, a little over 2 million in what I'd just call angel. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, tell kind of the story, I remember we were in a we were in a, a pitch meeting with an investor, and, and he was like, "Hey, if you're looking to raise, you know, a million and a half or two, don't talk to anyone else. I'm in with my partner. Um, you know, we'll get terms and everything ready next week." And then that same night, I remember getting a Wall Street Journal article, and the headline was like the the party's over for the uh, the tech companies, the VC party's over, all, all the slush fund money. And I was like, oh, darn, like Wall Street Journal's not often wrong. They're usually pretty, pretty accurate. Like, I hope this isn't the case. And that same investor the next week, you know, kind of ghosted and delayed. And then like, oh, we had a bunch tied up in the market with the, the reset, you know, the, the correction in the stock market and some real estate concerns. So we're, we're not in. And it was like, oh, man. And it just all these really excited investors kind of just dried up. And so uh, for the benefit, we went. Angel, we have some amazing angel investors that we couldn't love more, um, and it caused us to, you know, be more, you know, um, prudent and and frugal and, you know, profit minded, and so um, yeah, that was two years ago. We're at two million ARR and uh, have a team of you know twenty five ish, thirty depends on how you count it, and right on the cusp of profitability and doing a bigger a bigger raise, you know, yeah, two and a half years later, so. I just want to say congratulations because I know how scary it is to kind of just like jump out and especially when the markets change from a capital raising standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so for any disruptor out there that is looking to raise capital, what would be some insights or tips that has helped you along your way? Oh, that's a, a great question. I mean, um, so many things that go into it, right? Having the right story to tell, having the right presentation, um, getting the audience that you need. Um, so much of it, I think, is that first part, like getting in front of the people that you need to get in front of and having options. Because what I, I feel like I've seen, and I'm no expert in this, but FOMO drives so many of these deals. So, you know, you get one investor that's like, oh, these guys are awesome. I love this team. And then he's telling his, you know, really wealthy buddy or the other VC hears that they're investing and it's like, oh, well, we, why, why aren't we in? We need to get in there too. So you got to get to the right audience, you know, and, and then leverage that, uh, that FOMO, I think as much as you can. So 
be maybe my one bit of advice. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I feel like when we were doing our safe round for DFX, one of my friends goes to me, wait, why didn't you tell me about this earlier? Like, mm -hmm. I can't believe so-and-so already knew about this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, that wasn't even my strategy. I literally was just really busy, but it, it worked in my favor. And I so 100% agree. It's like, mm -hmm. it is that the first investment is the hardest. Yeah. But for us, it was like, we really want strategic capital. We want to be giving out matching advisory shares. We want to be building out our board and making sure that we have the right. For us, it wasn't just capital. It's like, we really want partners. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as, as you get to the, you know, where you have multiple people or parties that are looking to invest and you do get to be more picky selective. and choosy and selective. And so uh, that's that's been great for us as well to be able to pick partners that can bring a book of business or bring some referrals or those kinds of things that will drive it. So plug for uh, for DFX right out the gate because, you know, I, I wasn't just saying that. Like the biggest piece is getting the right people at the table to talk to. And so with what you guys are building, it's uh, it's pretty amazing to be able to, you know, have access to a lot of those contacts and people that are, are looking to invest or, or finance. And I want to just mention on that, I had my first ever investor reach out to me for DFX. And let me tell you, it's such a different energy exchange when mm -hmm. someone reaches out to you mm -hmm. to find mm -hmm. out more. Oh, yeah. And I was like, and that's what the whole, the whole business model is built on, the bumble, the woman reaching out to the man, the capital provider reaching out to the founder. And I will just tell you, it's you feel energetically cleaner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you start getting inbounds, oh. it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's so. a beautiful day. Yeah, that's great. And so let's jump into Listo. How is Listo disrupting the HR, the global talent of hiring and paying? Okay. So um, there's it's so interesting because... Uh, if you if you want to hire someone in a different country, um, the old school you know uh, CFO would say, well, like I said, like you got to stick your flag in the ground in Poland, yeah, and uh, you got to set up a legal entity and register it and everything, and that prevented so many small businesses from like I'm never going to invest that money just to then hire a person, even if the person in Poland is at a lower wage, I can't take advantage of that arbitrage in labor because I have all that upfront cost of getting all set up. Um, or my other option is just pay them under the table, right? Mm -hmm. 1099. And that can be difficult too, you know, um, the, you, it, like bank transfers and there's a little little payment solutions that you can use and mm -hmm. they cap out because there's KYC and, and different requirements that can make that difficult. So and it's just not efficient. And, yeah. and then all of a sudden you can have your contractor working for seven other companies. You don't sure. really know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So with ours, it's more uh, typically not gig type of workers. It's not you, you would use our platform more for long term contractors or what I would say, you know, in the U.S. we say W-2 employees. Yeah. And you don't need to set up the entity. If you do have an entity, some of our clients already do like, hey, we're, we're established in Costa Rica and we run payroll and you have our software to overlay that and, you know, expense reimbursements and time in, time out, time off requests, vacation, holidays, that's all in there. Mm. Um, and so it, it, it just fits seamlessly. Mm -hmm. So, And what, let's say I'm looking to recruit offshore. Mm -hmm. How can I leverage Lista? Like what countries can you guys recruit in? Great question. So the we have the software piece. So we, we like, I probably should have said this at the very beginning. Listo makes it easy to find, hire, and pay your global team. The software does the hire and pay. And the find part is still done through our recruiting network. So we don't pretend to have cracked the code on like AI matching your perfect candidate with the company and the needs. We still use human beings to do that, especially globally. So we have a network of recruiters all around the world, uh, new partners that we're bringing on all the time. So, um, you, you name the country, send us the job description, and we will present candidates to you. And we're not trying to, you know, become a rich recruiting firm, right? Mm. It's like what we look to do is just cover our costs on the recruiting um, and just we bill hourly for our recruiting time. And guys, it's only $70.5 per hour. Like yeah. I find a cheaper recruiter and let me know because I've never found one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's really low cost. Thanks, thanks like, for that. No, so. but there's like nothing of the upside. Normally it's like this plus a percentage of this and it like becomes like, oh, do I really want to do that? Yeah. Right. Where I think yours is a cleaner model because you say, tell me how many hours you want me to spend on this. Yeah. 
and we can ramp it up or we can slow it down. Yeah. Which yeah. I love. Well, and for anyone listening to this, like mention that you, you know, you you saw the podcast and Ella and uh, we do 10 hours of free recruiting all the time because we want companies to get started in global hiring. And again, our goal is to get more companies and users in the software paying their people and so if it's just, you know, if that if that upfront recruiting cost is prohibitive, mm. then by all means, let us help, you know, get, get you started there. Or we have a lot of companies that do do staffing. So, mm. you know, they pay a developer in Argentina 50 an hour and they bill their client 65. Mm. It, it's not transparent to the end client, but at least they don't have to pay upfront recruiting. And, mm. and so those companies use our software and I'm happy to make introductions to our clients who are doing that staffing model dev shops or virtual admin agencies because if they're if they're paying their people through our platform that's still great for us too so yeah we have a really good network kind of an informal marketplace if you will mm -hmm. of staffing solutions i'm excited to be able to leverage you guys for dfx once we raise our seed round in october we really and and that's what i love about my experience with working with joshua for for growth house like yeah, yeah. South Africa was never on my radar in Australia for some reason. Yep. And once I moved to the States, I was like, wow, these guys sounds between like an Aussie and a British. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I love it. Yep, I do too. I'm and right so you. I think South Africa is a really untapped market for talent. Like everyone's going to the Philippines. And for me, it worked when I was in Australia, but the time zones are a little bit challenging. So I think for DFX, you know, once October hits, we're going to be reaching out to you and being like, let's do South America and South Africa. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask where where are we going to get where are we going to yeah. do it, and I'm a huge fan of South Africa. Mainly, Josh has made such a great impression on me. I sing his praises all the time. He's Shout out, great. Josh! Yeah, he's phenomenal. We wish so. you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we'll get him here. Yeah, yeah, we do another raise. Us us in the same boat. Get some capital and let's fly him and his wife out here at some point. He's fantastic. So yeah. And so, what has been your experience? Um, I guess with hiring all of these different talents offshore, like would you say, um, what is your top five countries to to kind of recruit from? Um, wow, that's that's pretty hard to narrow it down that much because I have great really? pockets of talent all over the place. But um, I did do a, a pretty pricey consulting engagement with a big a big company, uh, e-commerce. And, you know, they, they were looking at 30 countries, 30, factors everything from like the size of the talent pool the education levels like how u.s friendly are they so many the taxes the wages everything um and i would say you know regionally um eastern europe and uh central america were very high so i would not in this order but central um mexico and costa rica are ones that we really love colombia um and then i I've always been a fan of Eastern Europe, Poland, Lithuania, the Baltics, um, Eastern Europe's phenomenal, phenomenal. And then if you're looking for, you know, customer support or sales talent or anything like that, um, I would say South Africa is a great option. I would say too. Um, Philippines as well, you know, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. And I guess what is some challenges you're seeing out there in the market for hiring and retaining good quality talent? Um, God, uh, yeah, the, it's the, if you, I think a lot of it just depends on the manager, you know, it's mm -hmm. the, the saying, you don't quit your, you don't quit your job, you quit your boss. And then I've heard another take on that. That's like, no, you don't quit your boss. You quit when you don't feel valued. And so on, on one end, like if you hire someone in a, one, one of our clients calls them high value markets where the, the cost per talent is mm -hmm. better because you know, if you want to hire a, a really senior full stack developer in the Bay Area for 200K, you could probably get that same talent level of experience in Costa Rica for 80, right? Um, and so if you value that person, it's gonna work out. And if you're the type of manager that shows that love and care and appreciation, it's gonna work out. Where it doesn't is, is the leaders that you know, can't, uh, can't manage a global team, that, that can't empathize uh, you know, and understand the little different cultural or nuances around the world, then it's, I'm the first to say like, do not do it. Don't do it till you're, you, you can embrace it till you have some exposure until you and are ready to enjoy the benefits of hiring a global team. That's such a good point. And what would you say, like, if you're putting on those training wheels and you're starting to 
want to venture offshore, but you know, your manager really hasn't had that experience yet. What would you say like would be the best way to kind of softly embark on that journey? Probably something, I mean, I guess it depends on what, you know, um, it could be as, as simple as like hiring a, a secretary in a, in a lower cost country. So, a, you know, a Philippines or, or Mexico or someone, a, an accountant or something that's like not, you're not depending, your whole business isn't depending on their code or their sales. Mm-hmm. Like start with something that's like, oh, this is going to alleviate. A lot of times though, what we do is we'll, we'll say like, okay, I am not good at accounting. So I need to hire for accounting and I'll hire this person. But actually, you, you know me, I love sales generation and sales automation and everything. And I would love to have Josh's job, but that's actually a really good one for me to outsource because I can very easily with minimal oversight, make sure that he's crushing it. And he does, he books 30, last month he booked 37 appointments. Can you believe that? Stop. Yeah. That makes me so happy. But I really do think from that perspective, just to touch on that from Josh, you guys crush your cold outreach. Yeah, we do. And I'm not even plugging Growth House because it really comes back to how you target like Thunderbird. Oh, yeah. Uh Like Thunderbird for you guys crushes it. (laughs) Alumni networks for cold outreach is something where I I saw your guys' feed and I'm like, this is pure gold. Yeah. If you ever do any kind of exec ed classes, you should do Thunderbird. They'd love you and you would love it as well. I it's really, really want to do it. It's yeah, just you like, should. who has the time these days? Yeah, well, you're right there in Phoenix, so you may may want to check it out. But um, yeah. yeah, it's been amazing. And uh, now we have a team, just a couple of contractors. It's actually a gal that we hired in the past in the Philippines. We placed her with a different company. And she's like, my kids need a job. Do you know anybody? And I said, they can do data enrichment for us, four bucks an hour, and they we give them a list and what they'll do is they'll go through LinkedIn profiles and say, this person has, at their company, they have people in these countries. Mm -hmm. And then we we're working on creating a custom line in our outreach that says, I noticed you have employees in Albania, Colombia, and Mexico. How are you hiring and paying them? And then from there we can, you know, get a, get a better engagement and kind of qualify the list, you know, qualify the leads before we even meet with them. Um, and so, at, you know, for a couple people at $4 an hour to, to scrub our list and do that market research, we're really excited about what that will do. And I guess full circling back, what are you most excited about for 2025? Ooh. Well, goodness, um, this is a little bit personal with us, but our, our founding team, we're not, you know, 22 year old startup. We're, we're, uh, a couple of us are almost 40 and one's over 40. So we are used to having budgets and you know being able to scale, and I'm really excited for um, having capital. And so I'm, I'm excited for hitting that mark and raising some funds and being able to really hire the the dream team. You know, I have the dream team now, but double it, triple it, and you know really hit the market hard because there's so much need and demand for our our solution. We we just need to get in front of as many companies as possible. So I I'm it's my dream job. I love it. I love what we do. Mm. And um, so uh, there, there's not enough answers to that question of what, what I'm excited about for 2025. So if you're listening and you're needing to hire, pay any kind of talent where anywhere in the world, mention DFX if you reach out to Listo. And I really encourage you to check it out because it's a lot more affordable than Deal. They're honestly, I'm not just saying this because you're here, but like the way you guys operate as a business, I've seen it being a service provided to you guys and you guys are amazing. Like, thank you. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. My last fun question is, would you prefer to do kind of like tree runs or hit the park? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, wait, is that, is that a a VC (laughs) term that I'm not familiar with? Like tree runs, uh. (laughs) Yeah, I, funny enough, um, yeah, I've been just, I just started jogging again after a long time of not jogging. So I guess tree runs. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Yep. So wait, when you say jogging, are you talking about skiing or snowboarding? Oh, <laughs> I thought you meant like runs, like jogging and like hiking and stuff. Okay. Oh so yeah, yeah. I should No, meant- I'm a snowboarder. Uh, uh, yeah. So I straight line down the hill. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. Cause I always want tree runs. I don't blame you. If I was a skier, I probably no, would. No, I'm too. a snowboarder. Oh, you are. Yeah, okay, I but I, I love that. the kind of the adrenaline. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, that's true. 
Okay, so next time that I'm out here, we have to hit up some runs together. Okay. Well, we're having a, a big Thunderbird thing. You're, we're going to call you an honorary Thunderbird in January. We're hosting it for like the global alumni in Utah. So let's see if we can get you up here. I would love that. You know, that's like my dream. The yeah. Thunderbirds, <laughs> honestly. It's like such a great community. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Landon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh-huh.